United Nations officials today said 70% of people in the Gaza Strip are displaced, many in living, condi- in living in conditions, a statement called, quote, inhumane. The Secretary General said the Gaza is becoming a, quote, graveyard for children. Israel's ambassador to the UN uh, lashed out at those at the comments, called for the Secretary General's resignation. Emily Callie Callahan is a nurse, activity manager for Doctors Without Borders, uh, MSF. She was evacuated last Wednesday and arrived back in the U.S. just over the weekend. First of all, how does it feel to be out? A lot of people keep asking me that, yeah. um, and I really don't have a good answer. Um, I obviously have a sense of relief that I'm home and I'm with my family and feel safe for the first time in 26 days and I'm having a really hard time finding any joy in any of it um, because me being safe is the result of having to leave people behind. People watching this have seen images from Gaza. They've seen the hospital images. They've seen the horror of children dead day after day after day after day. I mean, they've seen all the images but to actually be there and to experience it, you're experiencing all these things which a camera can never capture. So can you just talk a little bit about what stand when you close your eyes at night, what is it you think about now? I think the answer to that question, I think I, I'll start at KYTC, which was we were we were relocated about five times over the course of twenty six days due to security concerns. And one of the places we wound up was the Khan Yunis training center. We call it KYTC. That's when people had evacuated to the south. So you were in the south of yes, Gaza. Yes, when we point. went to Wadi, below Wadi Gaza line. And there were, by the time we left there, there were 35,000 internally displaced people living alongside us. There were children with just massive burns down their faces, down their necks, all over their limbs. And because the hospitals are so overwhelmed, they are being discharged immediately after, and they're being discharged to these camps with no access to running water. There's 50,000 people at that camp now in four toilets. They're given two hours of water every 12 hours. There's and four toilets for 50,000 people. Yes. Um, and that's where we were living too. And they have these fresh, open burns and wounds and partial amputations that are just walking around these conditions. And parents are bringing their children to us going, please, can you help? Please, can you help? And we have no supplies. When in situations where there are tens of thousands of people and it is a war and people don't, can't feed their kids, things get strange very fast and things get tough very, very fast and people turn on each other. You saw that up close. Um, At KYTC, we were, the reason we had to leave was because we were starting to be harassed. Um, People, desperate people who are losing loved ones right and left are angry. And they would point at me and scream American walking past. And at that point, we had no idea what was coming in the next few days. And uh, they would yell things in Hebrew to see if we were Israeli. Um, They accused our national staff of either being traitors or said, you're, you're pretending to be Arab. We know that you're just pretending to be Arab. Stop lying to us. And our staff had to defend themselves. And we said to them over and over again, you don't have to stay. We understand if you want to leave us. And they said, you are family too, and we're not going anywhere. Your staff, the, the Palestinians who work for MSF or Doctors Without Borders, were concerned about your safety. We would have died within a week without them. Um, they, they are the only reason we are alive. It's incredible that This took so long to get Americans, sick people, start to move through that Rafa border crossing. It's it's inexplicable. And we were desperate. We we did a calorie count at one point based on our supplies and figured out that if all of us, there's 50 people with us living in a parking lot now, only ate 700 calories a day. If that's all we had, we had two days of food left and that's it. And our national staff took off. We had no cell service at that point, so we had no idea what had happened to them. There's bombs going off all around us because there's no safe place in Gaza. Even getting through that Rafa border crossing, what was that like? 
they didn't leave our side for a second. You're um, the national staff. The national because staff. Because they feared for your safety, even at the border crossing. They made sure they were standing between us and desperate people. They made sure that they were talking to every official that they could find, trying to push us through, trying to get us on the bus, trying to get us out. And we're standing there and we're watching these incredible men who have sacrificed everything for us, who have sacrificed time with their families, their own physical safety, their own water supply they were giving to us. And we're watching them fight to get us across the border, knowing that we were not bringing them with us. And they didn't, they didn't waver. Um, Ibrahim was right in the front with our passports, fighting so hard to get us on. And we get to Arish that night and find out his parents are dead. They were losing family members and friends. You said if, if it wasn't for your national staff, you think you would have been killed mm -hmm. by people who were just desperate. We either would have starved to death or run out of water. They were the ones that negotiated all of that. They, Gaza is a small city, so everyone knows everyone. And they would call in favors and call their friends and say, who do you know that has food? Who do you know that's open? Where can we get this? And they would drive all over the place to find water. And when we ran out of bottled water in Gaza, they were the ones that were able to figure out that the water truck was coming here at these times. And oh, I know this guy is a grocery store and uh, they still have power sometimes. I think I can probably get something from them. Like we, when I say we would have starved to death without them, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. Um, and in the moments of absolute desperation of civilians, they were steadfast and calm and just talked to them and said, these people are also in the same boat that you are. They have no supplies. They also have no food and water. They are also sleeping outside on the concrete and did it in such a, beautiful way that they were able to talk them down with love and kindness. There was no violence in their heart and it calmed everyone around them down as well. Would you go back to Gaza? In a heartbeat, in an absolute heartbeat. Uh, my heart is in Gaza. It will stay in Gaza. The Palestinian people that I worked with, both our national staff in the office, as well as my staff at Indonesia hospital were some of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. Um, when everything went off um, and we got the notice to move south of Wadi Gaza, I was texting my, my nurses at Indonesia Hospital and I said, we, we lost a nurse weekend one. Um, he was killed when the ambulance outside the hospital was blown up. And I was texting them when we got the evacuation orders and I said, did any of you move south? Did any of you get out? Like, are any of you coming down this way? And the only answer I got was, this is our community. This is our family. These are our friends. If they're going to kill us, we're going to die saving as many people as we can. And I said, if I can ever have an ounce of the heart that you have, I will, I will die a happy person. They were incredible. I would like to send out a reminder that there are civilians seeking shelter there and that my doctors and nurses didn't leave out of loyalty to their community. And I know that there is an idea being pushed right now that anyone that stayed behind is going to be considered some kind of a threat. And I want to remind people that the people that stayed behind are heroes. The people that stayed behind are, are they know they're going to die and they're choosing to stay behind anyway. You're talking about doctors, nurses in the hospital. I wake up every morning and I send out a text message and I ask, are you alive? And every night before I go to sleep, I send another message and says, are you alive? Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.